Nothing's better than fresh fruit from the garden. I just can't say that enough. This particular plant will actually shoot up additional leaf tissue. The program was to create food for the public. They are public orchards. It's a lot of work, but it really is worth it when you see all these blooms and it's gorgeous. Hello and welcome to Great Gardening. I'm Dennis Lampkin, your host for this evening. We have our garden experts with us tonight. They are horticulturalist and garden expert uh, professional uh, Bob Olin and garden professional Deb Burns Erickson. As always, we want to hear from gardeners across the region who have questions for our experts on all things gardening. Volunteers from the St. Louis County Master Gardeners Program are here to answer the phones. Call locally uh, or toll free. You can call 218-788-2844 or 877-307-8762 or you can email us at email at uh, askwdse.org. Let's talk about current conditions. <laughs> Quite a day today. <laughs> National Gardening Day today. Isn't that yeah. something? It just reminds us what the great white north is all about, right. isn't it? Uh, yeah. Last Let's week we that. thought yeah. uh, a week later we'd be seeing the tulips up, but it's, they're going to be held back a little bit. There it is. Pussy mm -hmm. willows, that's mm -hmm. a sign, mm -hmm. right? That is a sign. This was just shot this afternoon, I believe. And uh, the only good thing about that is we're going to get some slow, slow melt, melt and some more moisture accumulation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe right. very critical this year. Right, no, no flooding. With we need to store up all that moisture yes, for the season that's ahead. Yep. Well, the theme for tonight's uh, episode is house plants. We'll have more information coming up, but uh, first we visited Deb uh, at the greenhouse and she taught us a simple way to propagate Dracaena. This is Zwart Top. It is a succulent. It has a really nice aesthetic value and they're not difficult to propagate. On these ones, what we do is we just We'll cut the tip off and then we just put it in dirt just like that and then they'll grow just like that. And so what happens is you take that bud and then the lower buds all start to break. Same with right here. It's amazing. These little things, this is probably five years old so in five years you could have this but you have to be somewhat diligent about taking those cuttings. And a lot of people won't take those cuttings, the, the leaves to break or the nodes to break on the sides. But it can be done and it's not difficult. And again, if you're starting with plants, start with some succulents. They are no fail. You just keep a really nice and light and dry soil and emulate where they come from, which is in Central Africa. Water them heavy on occasion, every one to two weeks, depending on the weather. They can go outside in the full sun. These were grown in the full sun here, and um, they're really easy to take care of, and I think they're beautiful too. But a lot of other succulents, you just take the cutting off the edge, like that. That's all you do, and you stick it like that, and that will root. That's why we have a lot of succulents. They are extremely easy to grow. This one also, we just, off of the sides, you can just break these off. If you get roots with it, that's great. But if you just set it there, it's going to root. Just don't overwater it and give it a lot of good light. Interesting. Deb, you wanted to talk about five houseplant myths. Right, right. And houseplants are extremely popular right now. And pandemic brought on a lot of that and brought in new gardeners. So these are some myths you're going to see. And um, number one is water your plants weekly on a regular schedule. Not true. Um, what you need to check them weekly for sure. But depending on how big the pot is, what type of house plant it is, the light situation, and if your heat is on them or if there's a cool um, area that they sit in, it's they're not going to need it weekly, uh, you're gonna need to check them. And then during the summer, they will. And once they're actively growing, then they're gonna need a lot more water. Um, and number two, um, put rocks at the bottom of a pot to help with drainage. So this is, there are new containers, a lot of really pretty containers that do not have drainage. Now I wouldn't plant in them and expect 
it to be able to stay dry at the bottom with just putting some rocks. I would either put a hole in it or I would put a container inside of that container. Terracotta is my favorite. You can take it out, you can check it, you can see if it's wet, stick your finger in it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so it's much easier to grow and much more successful. Um, number three, brown leaf tips means your plant is overwatered. My opinion, again, not true. Um, if, if it, it's interesting, this is a very interesting fact to me, that if the tip is brown and it's symmetrically brown and there's no irregular shape to it, then that is generally, it is too dry. Um, but there can be other problems mm -hmm. with a brown tip too. Mm -hmm. is, um, well, in our municipal waters, I know we've got both chlorine and fluoride in particular. So there's some of these thinner leaved uh, plants, spider plant, spider, yeah. uh, that can actually brown off because that fluoride gets carried to the tip. Right. Avoid it by just taking your water and just let it sit on the counter for 24 hours and the fluoride and the chlorine both evaporate right. into the air. And ferns are like that too. Ferns right. right. It's that too. thin leaf. That thin if leaf. it's a thicker leaf, you really don't have as much problem. So, and then number four is put your brand new plants in a bigger pot right away to encourage them to grow. Not true. Um, a lot of times, a lot of times, like Andresina or um, Sansevieria, they like a tighter pot. They do better in a tighter pot. But you can tell if the roots are tight by feeling if it's a plastic container. If that container feels hard and rigid because the roots are hard and rigid, well, then you do want to bump it up slightly. But if it is soft and um, the soil is not very taut when you put your finger in it, then the roots are not that root bound. And, and honestly, um, houseplants do better with a smaller container less chance of overwatering. And then number five, mist your plants to increase humidity levels. <laughs> Not true. Um, unless you are a professional grower and you have a one hour, every hour you have a one second mist go off, but that's no one but a grocery store or a professional grower. Like we do have that um, convenience in the greenhouse. But a lot of times if you, if you have a container and you put it in a saucer and you put rocks in the bottom of that saucer and then you fill it with water. So the roots can get to the water if they need it, but it also does help to evaporate and it is much more for humidity that way. That's great. So. What's your favorite soil moisture meter, Deb? Oh, your finger. Okay. Right? <laughs> exactly no. right. Exactly <laughs> right, Bob. And, and don't put it at the same um, um, spot every time. You okay. want to check a different one because sometimes it can get down deeper and deeper and then it's... Pretty useful. Absolutely. And the price is right. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, Deb. Interesting. Uh, let's get to a few questions. Uh, you know, last week's episode was on tomatoes, so we have a couple of uh, questions relating to tomatoes. What can be done for blossom end rot? Very common problem, and uh, we learned a little bit about that last year. Not only do you get blossom end rot on tomatoes, zucchini and other summer squash and our Peppers. pepper plants as well, and that is really a calcium deficiency. So either you don't have enough calcium in the soil, and that can happen in, the, in a potting soil Soilless situation. Mixture, Soilless mixture. Soilless mixture, peat mm -hmm. mixture. And there you might want to add some gypsum, which is calcium sulfate, or you might want to fertilize with calcium nitrate. But in a garden situation, you got plenty of calcium in the soil and it's transfer, translocation, irregular watering. And what we learned last year when it was so dry, you got to water on a very consistent basis. Otherwise, the calcium flow to the end of the uh, fruit itself stops and then the tissue decays and you get blossom in it. Consistent okay. water, plenty of calcium. Mm -hmm. Judy by the zoo wants to know what's a medium size uh, tomato to plant. Oh, a medium size, okay, not, so a beef steak. not a beefsteak. Well, <laughs> she not wants a, beef a meaty steak. tomato. <laughs> a meaty tomato. Well, okay, so a medium one, and meaty is Roma a lot. You know, there are different sizes of Romas. There are some great new genetics um, for Heartland and, um, oh, uh, Fourth of July. I mean, mm -hmm. they're, they're smaller and you're going to get lots of tomatoes, but they're meatier too. Yeah. Uh, you're right, your paste tomatoes, Amos paste, and uh, a San Marzano oh, would yeah. be another mm -hmm, one there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if she wants just a, a, a consistent, smaller, medium-sized tomato, uh, then I think we go back to uh, our celebrity yeah. and our champion. Exactly. And one we like now, Mountain Merit, now that things mm. have warmed up a little bit. Surprisingly, that's performing extremely well. Came from Dr. Gardner down in North Carolina. Speaking mm. about temperature, um, from Dennis uh, in Mattawa. What's the, uh, what temperature do you shoot for in the soil before you start planting your tomatoes? Oh, there you go. Well, tomatoes come from transplants. 
So uh, if, you know, usually we want warmer temperatures if we're direct seeding, that's when it becomes oh. critical. It's air temperature really that's, that's critical and you, you want to go a little bit later, I think, really, because uh, last year we've, we've learned the hard way that uh, even if you don't freeze a tomato off, uh, you set it back. It takes a while to restart. So you want to delay until air temperatures night and day are going to be uh, certainly above uh, 50, 55, maybe about, we've always said June 10th. We froze on June 11th a couple of places last, last year. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at uh, June 10th to June 12th, 15th in that range for transplanting them out. Okay. Uh, Shea in Hibbing has a six foot long chain link or six foot high chain link fence. What kind of shrubs can she plant for privacy? She wants them with shallow roots. Well, if she wants something uh, fast growing, I would do some things for some spring, summer, and fall color just so it doesn't look like a green fence all mm -hmm. the time, but like forsythia, um, some honeysuckle. You could do some honeysuckle vine too. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, she could get some good height up on them relatively quickly, but it's shallow roots are going to be difficult. That could be the challenge, yeah. yeah if you want six feet of height, you've got to have some depth. You've got to have some down below. She yeah. might look at uh, maybe a vine like Virginia Creeper to cover right. that fence mm -hmm. as well. It'll be a little slower, but... A little slower to, to fill in, right. but, uh, but doesn't require all that root structure. Or she could put in some annuals with yeah. it w w once it gets going, like morning mm -hmm. glories. Mm -hmm. You could definitely put in some morning glories with your Virginia Creeper, and you'll mm -hmm. get that appearance relatively mm -hmm. quickly. Mm -hmm. Good. Martha from Duluth asks, what's the best way to keep birds from eating grapes? <laughs> well, netting, I mean, right? That's about so the only way. Is there anything else? Uh, uh, well, there are other solutions, but we're not going to go into okay. them. <laughs> <laughs> netting, I think, netting, quite, okay. quite honestly, netting. is going to be your solution. You mm -hmm. just really have to net them. Yeah. And you can get these poly nets, quarter inch square, and they're not sure. expensive, and just yeah. mm -hmm. drape them over there. Yeah. John from Virginia brought in uh, plants last fall, and now he has dirt flies. Uh, how does he get rid of them? Fungus gnats. Fungus gnats. Fungus gnats. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel that it is a water issue more than anything if you let things dry out. I mean, don't put them in the uh, full sun and then let them dry out and expect your plants to be okay with that. But if you've got them in a low light situation and you let that soil get relatively dry um, so that they can't lay the eggs and the, and the next generation doesn't come along, that you can treat them that way. But there are other, you know, pesticides that you can use or you could use some neem oil or you yeah. could use some horticulture oil. Yeah, you could. Uh, you know, that can be a problem. We've got the fungus gnat and then we've got springtail the jumps, the columbola. Yep. And, uh, if you can't get them under control, a drench with some of these biologicals mm -hmm. probably isn't going to work in the soil. But you might have to go to a, a more conventional pesticide. Don't have labels indoors. You're going to have to wait till it warms up. And then just a small application of an over-the-counter material as a drench will okay. actually be quite effective. Mm -hmm. Or sticky, uh, sticky cards. You can try that too. Right, you know, yeah. Yeah, to help. Bob, you wanted to talk about the 10 uh, oh. most popular houseplants. Surely. Uh, you know, I really want to give credit to Carol Christensen. She's one of our master gardeners. These are her house plants, and uh, she's got a great project with other with other master gardeners where they're actually propagating house plants, taking them out into assisted living facilities, and bringing joy into that setting. So, congratulations, good work they're doing there. But we've, if we take a look at some of these, and there are so many hundreds, literally, of house plants yes. out there, and everybody's going to have their favorites. But certainly, the arrowhead plant here uh, will work very nicely. Criteria, I think something that's low maintenance will thrive in low light, doesn't require a lot of care. You can water quite easily. But arrowhead plant, the big begonia group, I think that's uh, very popular. The Chinese evergreen there at the bottom. Here's some variation, some color. We're seeing all these new introductions. Wouldn't you agree Lots with Lots of great breeding. A lot of great lot breeding, a lot of variegation in color. And then uh, the ferns there, you can see that group of her maidens there, rabbits, but uh, I mean, there's some great, great ferns out there. These we might have to be careful with the, uh, the fluoride in the water system. Right, that thinner leaf. Mm -hmm. Right, so let that sit for a while if you're getting burned along the tip margins. And then uh, the peperomia group, I love that name. I, I, I love the plant. It's you so love the easy. plant. I do. Mm -hmm. You're not going to put the pepperonia on your I've pizza. Well, yeah. uh, we've never tried, though, have we, Bob? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. no. so That's not pepperonia. You can't go make You don't know, Bob, really. <laughs> well, we don't know. Yeah, that's, that's right. It. We don't know. But then another group down there, Pothos or Devil's Ivy. Now, that's confused with philodendron. They're very, very easy to, easy to grow, easy to propagate. Uh, they tend to last forever in low light. The difference between the two, Pothos, think about uh, that heart, has a heart-shaped leaf. Think about the devil and heart. I don't know why I put that together. Philodendron is the other one that has kind of a sharper lancelet leaf. 
But uh, those are some of them. Here's another one, of course, our rubber tree, which is very, very popular, the Sansevieria. On the right there, that's a snake plant. Now classified as a Dracaena, Dracaena. I understand, mm -hmm. which is a new one for me, but yep. sometimes they're regrouping them based on genetics. And care, yeah. And, mm -hmm. care. and then the, uh, the succulents, which Deb mentioned, that are so easy to grow and propagate, right? Yep. And they do so well in our warmer, drier environment. And in that group, maybe some cacti as well. And then we've got another one that's, this one's jumped on the scene just recently. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, ZZ plant, and the reason they call it ZZ, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the right. genus and the species on that. They're really uh, something, but abbreviated as ZZ, not related to the rock band of years ago, but nonetheless a great plant. Beautiful, and there's some new black genetics that they're doing, the raven ZZ is beautiful. Yeah, so ZZ plant, I think that's one that uh, people weren't familiar with a few years ago, and it's coming on real strong right now. Mm -hmm, great. Mm -hmm. Bob, you had a, uh, an event uh, coming up for the community calendar? Yeah, we really do. We've got our spring gardening extravaganza. I'm pleased to say both Deb and I are going to be on that mm -hmm. particular program, and that's down at the depot on April 23rd. It's going to be a full day, whoa, at 9 a.m. until 2.30 rather than 1.30, so we've actually expanded that, I guess, a little bit since this slide was made. Uh, you can visit c at umn.edu to register slash, there it is, SLC Garden, or just call the St. Louis County Extension Office, 218-733-2870. Great day. Uh, we're going to give everybody sunflower seeds. We're going to have a discussion about planting up our community in honor of the uh, uh, salute to the Ukrainian folks with sunflowers, but everything from uh, growing edibles. The concept is an integrated garden, so we're going to have edibles, small fruit, tomatoes, peppers, and then we're going to have pollinator gardens. Mm -hmm. Deb's going to talk about some of her favorite not just uh, shrubs as well as annuals Angles. that attract mm -hmm. pollinators. A little and bit feed on them all lawns. summer. Yeah, we're going to try to feed them all summer. We're going to have just really a great time, lots of participants. So that if you want to join us. always a lot of fun. Fun down at the depot. And Absolutely. I know you're associated with yep. that fine uh, facility down yep. there, Dennis. And yep. thank you for being on their board as well. <laughs> it's always fun. Um, uh, Bobby from we uh, Spirit Valley, West Duluth, wants to know, why do his roses sometimes bloom in June, but sometimes in, not until July? Temperature and, yeah. and how, how early our spring is. I wonder what our spring is going to look like this year. Because yeah. I feel like May is going to be warm. Because a lot of times we have alternating months. I feel at least that's the way we kind of track it. If we have a cool April, then a lot of times we'll have a really warm May. We have a term for that. It's called reversion to the mean. Where oh, <laughs> I didn't even know. Where, where you'll see that oftentimes where it's real cold and then... And then it gets real warm, yes. and then it all comes together, and it was just an average year. But when you had extremes right. on both sides. Right. So who knows what's going to come. Yeah. But temperature, You know, yeah. Deb, what do you think about that budding? We've got to get those, those flower buds to set up as well. And sometimes right. it can be too cold, too hot, not enough fertility, not enough phosphorus. So maybe... And in the fall when they set. Right. If, those, if you kind of give up on mm -hmm. roses, because roses can be high maintenance. Yes. And at yes. The, by the end in the fall, and you're just like, oh, I'm done. I'm done. I'm so done. Well, yes. you shouldn't be done because your next year might suffer from it. Right. Yeah. So just keep going. The plant's going to do what it can. You can sometimes, as real hot, cool the buds down a little bit so that they don't abort on you. But mm -hmm. for the most Modern. part, they're going to operate on their own schedule, depending on the weather. Mm -hmm. Dennis from Mountain Iron found a patch of uh, asparagus in the woods. Is there anything he can do to fertilize it? Would wood ash help? Ooh, it's a good mm. question. Um, you know, yeah, a little fertility, uh, high nitrogen fertilizer, not your wood ash. Now, wood ash, uh, you never want to apply wood ash. There's potassium, there's mm -hmm. phosphorus in it, but uh, it's a liming agent. Mm -hmm. So we never really want to apply wood ash unless you've got a soil test that indicates that you need lime. Then you can substitute a, even a little bit less of wood ash. But a little bit of a nitrogen fertilizer, even a little compost would help early in the year as those... Uh, fronds are beginning to emerge. And really weed it. Mm -hmm. Really yeah. weed it and really compost it. Yeah. Sure. That'll and enjoy them early. Yeah. And enjoy them early. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Marilyn from Duluth. Uh, last fall she mulched her garden very heavily. Now what does she do to add compost? <laughs> I feel like she should break it off. That, yeah. that, I mean it's a lot of work but I feel like you've got to get it off in order to get that compost in there. Yep. Yeah, I, I agree. I think a mulch is, you don't want that to break down. It's on the mm -hmm. soil surface because that holds the water, retains the, the leaves. But if she's going to incorporate that, she needs a little extra nitrogen, and we would really like her to rake it off, mm -hmm. work the compost into the soil, and then she can bring it back on yeah. so it can serve its function as a mulch. Or she could rake it off and put it in the compost pile and get it partially decomposed mm -hmm. and then ultimately incorporate that into the soil as well. Yeah. Good. Yeah. 
that's a solution for her, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. um, Amy uh, stored her her dahlia tubers in the basement. When should she bring them out and start uh, um, getting them exposed? Well, it depends on, does she want to start it early in the house? It depends on really the dahlia, type of dahlia that it is. Um, and, and, and she should get them out though and really look at them and make sure they're dry enough. I mean, basements mm -hmm. can get a little mildewy and a little mm -hmm. wet. Mm -hmm. um, so I would get them out and start looking at them, making sure that they're good and viable. Uh, we start ours in containers and mm -hmm. we, we start ours right now. We'll drop them down, you know, okay. and just get a, you can get a head start. So get you can get a, get a bloom a earlier. So you can move out. Yeah. 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 And now let's take a look at your sent in pictures with the local dirt. Let's see what's growing in your neighborhood with the local dirt. Kelly Ritterspoon sent us a Nile rhododendron. Over time, it flowered into something beautiful. Lee Iverson has fencing featured across their garden. First, let's take a look at healthy hostas, always a lovely highlight. Next, the theme continues with lilies lined up along another fence line. Lee also showed us beautiful blooming Nellie Moser clematis that provide alluring accents for garden features. And finally, Lila Coates White sent us some very pretty catmint and allium. Send us photos from your neighborhood. Email us at greatgardening at wdse.org and it could show up on air or on our Instagram feed. Well, thank you all for uh, calling in. We're getting a lot of questions. Uh, we have a few more. We'll try to get through them as quickly as we can. How do we fertilize blueberry plants? Uh, John wants to know. Another go, great, Bob, go. Another good, great question. You only want to fertilize with an acidifying fertilizer. You want to keep your, your pH down. And I'm going to say ammonium sulfate. Not aluminum sulfate. We see that. We see it in the containers. Uh, you get aluminum, potential aluminum contamination, ammonium sulfate in the spring of the year, just as the buds are beginning to break. Okay. Uh, Peter from Aurora, my carrots are always small. I have sandy soil. How do I grow larger carrots? Mm. Well, one of the issues really is the sandy soil. Yeah. Uh, there's not enough nutrient for the plant, and they might be closer together. Spread them out, start them early, um, get them to germinate early. Yeah, that it. takes consistent moisture. moisture. And then uh, work some compost, we talked about, into mm -hmm. that soil. Mm -hmm. You need to get some more nutrient to that plant, start early, germinate early, and spread them out. Then them Feed down. them all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jane from Duluth, when uh, should I be removing straw from my perennials? Mm. Oh, wow. Depends how tender those perennials can, are. Right, huh? right. Wow. Some things like garlic, take it off right now, they're mm -hmm. tough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, it does depend on how tough it is. It depends on the perennial she's talking about. But yep. if she is putting straw in, I'm thinking they're more tender. They'd mm -hmm. have to be, because mm -hmm. otherwise if they're hardy, you're not going to need to put straw on them. Well, we, we do mulch in a lot, of, like garlic as an example, or mm -hmm. in some cases our tulips as well. We're going to still want to mulch because the bulb, if we get no snow and mm -hmm. then we get oh, frost right, penetration, right, right, right. we might lose the bulb. But the, the shoot itself can take 18, 19, 20 degrees. Mm -hmm. So it does depend on the perennial. A real yeah. tender perennial, she wants to wait a while. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly some of the hardier perennials like your garlic and so forth, that, that yeah, can come off now. Sure. And you want to open that up because they will push their way through these mulch. Mm -hmm. But you get these twisted stems mm -hmm. that come as a result. So even though there's snow on the ground, it's not that cold, she can start taking some of that off on the hardy ones. Okay. Mm -hmm. Gail in Woodland, uh, what's the best soil for a raised bed? She has four by four, 12 inches high, they're galvanized metal. Hmm. Okay, best okay. soil, Okay. she's going to fill that. Mm -hmm. uh, for the most part, we're going to be dealing perhaps with a peat-based soil, mm -hmm. but we like to mix something up where we've got a sandy loam mineral soil mixed with the peat. Mm -hmm. So we, w we want good drainage, but if we have just a peat soil, in most cases we've got a lot of acidity, yeah. this is an acid peat, mm -hmm. And we have very little nutrients, so you're going to have to supply not only nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, but all your trace. Mm -hmm. So bring in a sandy loam mineral soil and mix that with a peat and create your own well-drained soil that will fill that bit. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And yeah, you might not need, like you say, amending. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to make your own mix. You want it to drain well, but you want the nutrient that comes mm -hmm. from a sandy. Don't put a lot of clay in there and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Get yourself some sandy loam. That can be purchased. There's not a lot of it around. Spend the money because it's going to be there for a long time exactly. for you. Exactly. Okay. Right. Dorothy from Duluth wants to know how to wake up her geraniums. Oh, okay. Depends on what she w did with them. Now, did she let them dry out? I mean, they are really a perennial once if you treat them kindly. Um, but right now, she can have them in the dirt. They should be in dirt right now. They should be watered. They should break bud. Um, there's no reason not to wake them up now. A good potting soil, um, a little fertility. They do like fertility. Um, um, and, and a good water, let it water it in once good. and let it start to break. Could we still cut them back or is it a little late for that? Do you oh, think? you could. It's yeah. a geranium. Yeah. You well, know, you cannot really kill a geranium. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for tuning in to Great Gardening. If you want more, you can follow us on Instagram at Great Gardening WDSE. Subscribe to us on YouTube at youtube.com backslash Great Gardening and like us on WDSE WRPT on Facebook. If you missed any part of the show, it'll be posted to our YouTube channel and on the PBS app tomorrow. Um, thanks, Bob, Deb. It's an interesting show. Thank we have, still have some questions for next week. Um, we'll be back next week. Uh, and from all of us here, thank you and enjoy the garden. <laughs>